Hello, good evening. Uh, my name is Susan Oxby. I'd like to welcome you to the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive to First Person Cinema, Marie Menken, Margaret Tate, and Uta Arond. And it's a really great pleasure for us to welcome Berlin filmmaker Uta Arond to Berkeley uh, for a three program series. This is the second program, and we continue with the third and final program on Sunday at 4 p.m. Uh, just off the top, I'd like to say that the series is support, supported in part by the National Endowment for the Arts and also our thanks to German Films for helping to underwrite part of the travel uh, for this uh, visit. Now, I see some, some of you who were not here last night. I'm going to just say a few words about biography related to Uta Aron before welcoming her to introduce the program. Uta Aron was born in Frankfurt but really grew up grew up in Berlin. She's a true Berliner. And uh, she works as an independent filmmaker, a teacher, an independent curator, and really has throughout her career championed the work of uh, women filmmakers and independent uh, artist filmmakers' works. She studied at the film school in Berlin between 1979 and 1985. And her own works produced since 1985 number more than 40 in total. These works are of varying lengths, from a few minutes to uh, hour-long uh, films. And uh, one of the things I, I love is that Uta's whole life is centered around the art-making practice, her community in Berlin and internationally, but also the way that she devotes her time to making work through the years uh, in a very devoted way. She uses 16 millimeter format as her chosen medium, and if you're familiar with 16 millimeter film, you may also be familiar with the Bolex camera, which probably weighs about three to four pounds. It's a mechanical camera. It's a really versatile tool in Ucha's hands where she can picture the world in a very intimate way, in a way which um, the way that she observes the play of light, the rhythm in nature, or the works that she she makes, which often have portraiture as their subject, are very fluid, very fleet, as was commented last night, and um, I find extremely beautiful. They're um, short works that are very large in dimension. Um, I also very much appreciate and respect um, the, the quality of her ca camera work, and I, I, it's been enjoyable last night, and I, I know over the next two programs to hear Uta talk about how she uses film language artistically. Um, let me also just comment um, that as an independent curator, she was involved with a collective um, based in Berlin called Film Samstag for a decade-long period from 1997 to 2007. But she has done a lot of curating through the years and some um, writing and much championing of the works of Marie Mankin and Margaret Tate featured in this series. I want to um, welcome Uta to the podium to um, set up the first works on the program. And I'll just mention that um, there are five works on the program, total length of 66 minutes, but we will raise the house lights um, before the final film in garden, in the garden, and so that Uta can also speak about that film specifically. Uta Aran. Yeah. Thank you for coming tonight. So. Um, um, I speak as if I haven't seen you before. <laughs> so some were there yesterday, some don't. So um, I was speaking, uh, or you know, it's a program. Uh, Susan curated it. Um, it's about we'd see five films tonight, and we decided that we we will see the first sh four films in one unit, and that means we will start with the um, triptych of myself, uh, a film of my by myself, um, a silent one. Um, which gives you an insight in how I'm working. And um, and then we go to Arabest for Kenneth Enger by Mary Menken. And I don't know if you are familiar, but she is an American filmmaker. She died in uh, 68 and she made not such a big um, number of films, all short. And I discovered her actually through, there was one film of hers in the collection in Berlin, in the Arsenal. Um, Dwight Yana, and then I also read uh, Jonas Mikas was writing in the movie journal about her, and I liked very much his writing. And where he put the finger on her work was um, speaking to me uh, in a way that it, it was so inspiring that I thought I have to see her films. So um, 
in in a, in a series which I did in '95, which was devoted to 100 years of cinema, um, especially focusing on the work of women, there was a list um, cruising around, uh, like the important uh, female directors, one can say. And this list was um, including names which were already so familiar to me that I thought this we have to find something else. And I um, started a series for one year, 12 months, where I was asking um, not only women filmmakers, but also maybe an artist or a philosopher, choosing a film by a woman which was important for her. And through this series, we, we made um, a lot of discoveries, uh, so to speak, by chance, but not I mean, for the person it was not. And if the person who was choosing the film was a filmmaker, we showed also her work. In, and um, so this, this was supported. And I had some money, and uh, but actually it's not true what I'm saying because it's just, the Mencken films we bought not through this money. The Mencken films we bought just uh, through Anthology Film Archive and the Arsenal. So I had the idea I want to bring the Mencken films to Germany, and um, and we arranged it that we could buy the prints, and then we had tours touring it through Germany and and showed it also in Berlin. So this was not right, but by myself history is, is cheating also. Um, but with the Tate. But anyway, you will see it is a very personal. Maybe maybe Mencken and Tate are very different. You will experience even in the two films. Um, both were working like me with a handheld camera. I think most of the time without a tripod. Not basically, I think Tate also used a tripod, but Mencken was very much also physically using the, the Bolex as an extension of the own body. And um, and the lightness and playfulness in, in Mencken was always uh, fascinating for me. And the independence, that means she was, I mean, many people know Maya Darren's work, but she was a real, even she wrote about um or she talked about herself as an amateur, but this was the amateur because she was someone who loves what she's doing. But she, in my perspective, in a way, was more professional. But Mencken um, was a real amateur, so to speak. She was not, um, she was part of the whole new American cinema scene, like like Nikas and Breckage, and they were all friends and, and meeting, but she was not focusing on a career, and one can say, but we can maybe talk about this later after because we have, we we are all female here in the program. So um, maybe there's also a gender aspect which is interesting, how to focus or how to be free. That means we are not part of the cultural or film historic discourse. So maybe this allows some freedom. That's my theory, I hope. Um, yeah, so um, the Mencken, it is uh, called Our Best for Kenneth Enger, which is also um, a contribution to a friend, a filmmaker, friend. And um, Portrait of Gar from Margaret Tate is a portrait of her mother. And one of her very first films she made, she was a doctor, trained as a doctor, uh, serving in India during the Second World War, but then changing her mind and thinking, uh, I, I want to do something creative. First, she wanted to turn towards writing, but then she decided to go to the film school in Rome and really learned filmmaking and became a filmmaker, um, went back to Scotland, um, was very full of hope that she will get money and, and can produce, but it was not so easy. So uh, there was no uh, financial support. Uh, she turned more towards writing poetry but um, but continued all the time also her filmmaking. And um, during the years she died in uh, 98, um, she, she realized a lot of work, completely independent, uh, except her last feature film, only last feature film, A Blue Black Permanent was uh, a BFI production. And, um, but she dreamed about um, making a longer second feature and um, when I visited her in '95 in the Orkney Islands, she, she, I, I was always, I, I quoted it also yesterday, that she said, when I spoke about her short film, um, film aesthetics or, or spirit, um, 
I saw a big difference between the short ones and the long ones, which where she was working with the camera person and the team. She said, no, 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 there's no difference. It, all films are the same. So it's all my, my, my spirit, my attention, how I see the world and what I want to say. And I've, I've, I, I found this very interesting. So I think on this point we stop and I can, can later, you can ask me more questions also about the two and I will maybe try to answer. So, yeah. Oh yeah, Maria and the World. Um, so we go from the portrait of Gar to another portrait, which I made uh, um, of Maria, a close friend of mine, Maria Lang. We also made a film together later, but in '95 um, I visited her at the countryside where she was living with her mother. She decided she was at the film school also, but then she decided to go and look after her mother, uh, and it turned out it became the next 20 years of her life. To look for the mother and so it was um yeah it has a big impact on how how her, her life was going and um it has sound this film and <laughs> enjoy the first four films and then we we come back i come back and then it'll be great I was recognizing, uh, even I was thinking, even if I'm thinking about the last film, I don't think about language, but of course when I'm sitting here and we show it to you, then um, you can't understand, I basically said to some people. Um, so um, what, you, what, I, what, was, what you were hearing was basically, of course, little things from um, recordings in the kitchen and recordings uh, of uh, daily talk, but um, some in between, sometimes I'm reading um, out of letters which uh, Maria wrote me. So we were, when she was living on the countryside, which was in the southern uh, part of Germany, so quite far away from Berlin, and we didn't meet each other so often, so we had a, um, a very intense letter contact so um, when I was making the soundtrack I was just going through the letters and took little excerpts from uh, from her writings to me and um, and also maybe it's interesting the whole soundtrack how I worked on it I was also of course it's from 95 so it's a little it's long ago but I was really establishing I was working with chance elements so I had some recordings of the music some of the of the um, of the language of the letters and I put um, I don't know exactly how I did it but I had only two tape recorders and you hear sometimes bzzz, when I'm going forward you know and just by chance I stopped and I knew of course this is a piece of Mahler and this is a piece of I don't know different um, musicians so um, I was just selecting pre-selecting and then looking for a chance that the chance is helping me, you know, and then of course I had the opportunity, but it was one track, so so the mixing was, I mean, even it is made on 16 millimeter with careful magnetic, but we usually we had at least two parallel tracks, but here it was just one, you know, so there was no, there was actually no mix. I did the whole mix because there was no, I didn't went to a sound studio or anything for the final mix. Okay, so and, and also a lot, uh, it, is, it is edited on the editing table, but a lot is in camera work. So um, superimpositions, they're not completely under control. It's not in the lab. It is just uh, in camera by rewinding. With the Bolex, you can do it uh, easily. You just close all the doors and, and just rewind the, 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 the footage in the camera. And um, yeah, and, and basically also maybe for the first three films, they are later, of course. Uh, then uh, you see there. There are. Um, I'm. I'm trying while filming. I'm trying to to catch the rhythm, and the decisions are made while I'm filming. So I'm always speaking about improvisation, and but then I go to the editing table, and the final editing is is done on the t on the on the table. You know, we call it editing table. You know, flat flat band something. Um. Yeah. And I think 
Maybe we could we'll talk this later. But now we jump to the last film, Im Garten, and this is a collaboration. I did it with Bärbel Freund, and we studied together at the film school. And um, actually, it is a garden outside of Berlin in Potsdam Bornim, and it's a favorite, uh, famous garden um, concerning the, the 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 man who founded it. He also um, was very deep interested in the maybe in the 30s in the 20s he started already um, uh, how could I say he was focusing on plants he was against annual plants he was for perennials I think you call it so he was really going to um, also a lot from Japan and, and other countries he was collecting plants and he was his whole garden was the idea we have to create a garden that is working through the whole year. And he established for this idea seven seasons, not anymore four. He established seven seasons. And Bärbel was a visitor in the garden, and there was at that time the, doc uh, the daughter of his um, taking care. It was in East Germany, um, but after the reunion, the daughter came back from Belgium, and she uh, continued working on, uh, in the garden. And it was a kind of uh, association at that time. And um, they had also had the nursery. And anyway, Frau Förster, um, she she talked sometimes to the visitors in the garden. And so she, she started a chat with, with Bärbel and asked, what are you doing? And she said, I'm a filmmaker. And she said, oh, I always wanted to have a film about my garden, about the garden. And um, so Bärbel said, hmm, I don't know, yeah. And then she came asked me and said can you imagine we make a film about the garden so we were going and looking and then um, we decided yeah we, we tried to make a film about the garden so uh, we we, cho we then we chose the structure just every month we went for two or three days um, and I don't know exactly when we started I think we started in early autumn and went through the whole year and then we, we started first with one camera, but then it, uh, very, very shortly it was clear we, we cannot work with one camera. So each of us needs their own camera that we are not always discussing decisions, what we film. So then we had an independent, everybody was working in the same days, in the same season, but with two cameras. And you will see it also in the result, the different aesthetics and the different film language and, and uh, time of, of um, space uh, or not space but anyway and um and then was the decision do we need sound we taped also sound but in the end in the final we decided the the film is silent so we will see 29 minutes silence and we go through the year with seven seasons Yeah, thank you. What a treat, Uta, to see um, in Garden, but all this whole program. Actually, this film, In the Garden, was my entry point with your films that, from 2002. I remember you presented this at the Toronto International Film Festival as a premiere, and uh, I remember watching this film maybe five or six times in, a, in that time frame. Uh, and uh, what a pleasure to see it here tonight. You know, a great example of 16 millimeter and all of the latitude that um, this format allows you expressively. If it's, if it's a demonstration of, of overexposure to underexposure, but seeing that uh, those qualities and the delicacy of, of your, the camera work and all of what you're doing in, in this film, it's just a, it is really remarkable. Thank you so much for showing it. And, um, Time for um, any questions uh, you have. Have any for Uta? Um, we do have mic runners down the aisles. <coughs> and um, is there anything you want to? Uh, no, but I would, uh, also was saying thanks, Susan, because it, it, it's actually because of this film I'm here. I mean, it was the beginning, you know. Susan Oxtory did the uh, wavelengths at that time in Toronto at the TIFF. And um, then she invited us, and so she became more familiar with the work. <laughs> and I also thought it, it looks beautiful. Anyway. Thank you. 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 Th
Yes, it's beautiful. And this work, having a single subject, I think on Sunday our program will have <clears throat> both another example of your work, uh, Buildings Underground, the English title, um, a, a, you know, beautiful sense of a study of place and uh, mm -hmm. a single subject for you, but also the Margaret Tate poem, and I was going to just Present. remind myself of the title. Yeah. Uh, there are two beautiful works. Um, her film, A Place of Work, mm -hmm. I think... Uh, in the in the examples of films that you're showing this week, it's just really nice to see some of these longer works, um, very rich and, and powerful in the way that you're examining place as well as portraiture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Got any questions for Bridget? Yeah, I'll bring you the microphone. Hey, thanks for showing your films. Um, one of my favorite moments in your films are those where you are playing with um, kind of indistinctness, which you achieve through a number of different methods, such as <clears throat> overexposing or underexposing, or through um, a really kind of blurry focus, or choosing images where figure and ground are so similar in, in color or so complexly textured that they're hard to tell apart, yeah. or, like, or the conditions in which you're filming are so hazy or snowy that it's like hard to tell the land from the sea, from the sky. And I was uh, wondering how you think about this, this, this kind of aesthetic of indistinctiveness that, it, that, um, that you kind of cultivate in these many ways in which I, I feel like I've observed such moments in all of the films of yours that you've shown us. Um, indistinctiveness, Robert or, or Maggie, can you give me a translation? Yeah. Cloud? So nicht bestimmt, oder? Unbestimmt. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> So you mean why I'm why I'm pulled towards it, or what is interesting me in it? Yeah, and what yeah. what you're thinking about? Yeah, when you're to I mean it is it's interesting in the program because in the garden, uh, and then Maria und die Welt is a little bit a kind of two two extreme points, two sides. So I think like in Maria maybe it is more what you what you are saying. I don't know this kind of yeah totally yeah. So um, yeah it. Um, it it goes also with the with the maybe with the what sometimes means tempo or or um, um, how do I say sometimes I say it's just if you touch something very briefly and almost not, not um, that uh, yesterday I think flüchtig fleeting or or you know not grabbing it not holding it so so. Um, but that means also maybe you do see something only in the edge of an eye and not really focusing on it. I don't know. It's it's something I believe that when we have in this in this little tiny moments of touch, but it can can be very strong. It's like even this is very fast. My filming or my editing is very fast. Um, it is as if uh, these little moments are out of time, sl slipping out of time. So I don't know. It's it's uh, it's maybe also a fear of something where you don't want to grab it, you don't want to hold it. So at the same, it is uh, maybe an instinct of the only way to survive is just to 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 go with it. You know, I don't know. But I think you hit on an excellent point of of beauty, great beauty in your work. And and <clears throat> for example, in the last film in Garden, I was seeing this issue of figure ground. Mm -hmm. Um, with the, the, the frozen leaves. Um, I looked at the image and I thought, ah, that could be a tapestry, or that could be a fine art uh, mm -hmm. image. Mm -hmm. But here we know it's celluloid, we know that it's the real world. But um, I, I think you're, that's a really nice observation that you made about mm -hmm. um, many, many moments in your, your films. Mm -hmm. Maggie, the mic is for you. Yes, thanks. <laughs> I just, uh, I, I realized that I, I could I very seldom would experience this. That is, are all of the the silence of the garden, whereas in the other ones we've had some background there. Mm -hmm. 
<clears throat> I was like, well, the pain is what, if I were to go in that dark room, I would only see what's in there. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't go in and out unless my glasses were off or something. But uh, it, it also means that I don't have that uh, pressure to have any kind of sound opinion because that's been taken out of me. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's really quite a different experience of uh, things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, really enjoyed these films. Uh, kind of a follow on to the question about a fleeting quality. I wonder if when you're shooting, particularly if you're shooting in someone's home, as in Maria from the Well, your practice is also fleeting. Uh, it's something you can pick up and put down, or whether you concentrate. I just definitely curious about your practice. <clears throat> I mean, this was a little, this was maybe two or three visits when I'm staying there for several days with her. So it, it differs. There, there are, in the beginning, there is a section which is silent and I'm very close. And this is with a macro I was playing at that time, fascinated by little rings you can put between the lens and the, and the, body of the bullet camera and you can come very close so, so I was in the macro world and this I filmed actually in her room on her desk but she was not in in the room so I was alone and um, it was a special way of discovering our dialogue with, with her not there and then the other moments when she was doing something like in the kitchen preparing or with her mother that that in small kind of dialogue situation where um, yeah so um, I think so. I just wondered about maybe when there's another person, if if you're socially interacting with them, or if it's yeah, more I mean, there's always time. Of of course, you know. I mean, we we are creating a new time in the film, but there's yeah. things in between, talking or, or or even when we made the walk and she's in the fields, we were we were taking the walk and I filmed uh, several moments only, or, or going around her, or we go to special places which she likes, or so that. Yeah, I would say basically, except I'm alone with the camera, this is different, but when I'm together with a the person, then it's always a kind of, uh, there is one one uh, shared continuation time, and there's the other film filmmaking time, which is, uh, which is the creation of a new timeline. Well, I'm wondering about your editing process um, and um, some of the some of the particular shots that you had that um, would of course not make the cut. You know, like when you're moving the camera like that, mm -hmm. or whether I, I'm assuming that was deliberate. Um, um, and then also that wonderful motion you had toward the end when you approached the object like that. I'm wondering about your the camera motion, like how you move it around, and then what what things did not make the cut in terms of the editing. Mm -hmm. Maybe, uh, uh, two questions, I guess: yeah. motion and editing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's different. Yeah, I some of the, of course, as you said, some is in the camera, it's some movements, or some even some cuts are in camera, and some are on the editing table later. Decisions conscious decisions but um, basically when the movement is created it is really um, it is coming more out of this intuitive relation to the object or to the person or to the mood I'm in um, so I think movements also waving a little bit going back and forth and close and away is is circling around something you know circling around without just going directly towards it and um, and so sometimes I like, oh, yeah, I think it is this kind of distance and closeness and, and the space in between um, where we, uh, where we maybe have, in a, it, it sounds contradictory, but where we have some time to, to, to find ourselves, you know, what, what is it, what is, what is it about? I don't know. So it's, um, it's a little bit this, this, 
I don't want to say searching, but there is, of course, a big search also in when one is doing something creatively. So it is not just we don't know exactly where we want to go. So the process is always, always there where something happens with me and with the film, which is not completely under control. the garden it struck me that only now that as far as i know there weren't any people in it yeah i mean there were yeah it was different there were sometimes there were, there were moments there were a lot of people in it but we decided we had footage also with people i mean we went with the, with this film we had maybe the relation of footage to, uh, I think it was maybe one to one to two, one to two and a half. So we had also people because we were not sure if we really want to exclude the people. But finally, in the in the editing, we excluded them. There, I was I was thinking, yeah, there was just one person walking through in the in one image. And so um, yeah. Oh, you found another person. That's good. <laughs> Well, that it's, is it. And, uh, I, the, hmm? the cat, too. I mean, the cat, not, yeah. The cat, like of the course. It's people playing bridge when there's a big thing that's going on. So, yeah. So, it, so there's always a very sort of stark focus on the cat. And then there's stark focus on the horses. But they're really playing bridge characters. That these, these uh, plants or beautiful flowers are, are, have an awful lot of meaning. So yes. In fact, it's like you, your, what you were saying. And that's... That's, uh, you can't do that when you don't, I mean, you're, you really don't realize the incredible, you know, uh, 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 factors in these, yeah. in these films. And, uh, uh, and, and allowing this kind of thing to proceed where it's hard not to do it. Yeah. I mean, I was, I was thinking, uh, diff uh, uh, the wind also. The wind, this time I was very aware of the wind. So there's always movement. There's never something completely still. Even we think there's no wind, but the but the delicate uh, uh, um, things can move even with very little uh, movement in the air. So this is communication. And I want to say um, um, another film, which is really maybe Susan um, Agnes Martin, the 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 artist. She made one long feature film. It's called Gabriel, and um, we, sh we showed it also in the 90s when I figured it out and found uh, on her, um, bio, uh, I mean, like, I don't know what you call it, not biography, not filmography, but her, her life, that she made this film. And it is really an, a, a beautiful, beautiful film. And she filmed also a lot of flowers. And, and she filmed them so lively that, that I thought, my goodness, how can one film nature so lively? So I was thinking when I saw those, some some of our shots, I thought it's also we were successful bringing this to life. Not just you know reproduce it and say oh yeah beautiful. That's 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 a challenge when when because it's all very beautiful. Yes. Yeah, I think so. Maybe two, two um, I think one, I don't know, one, two, two, two and a half, about, so not so much. We were very limited in, in, the, in the stock, you know, we had not so much money for the film and we had the, when we went with the two cameras loaded, loaded, and um, I don't know how much we shot each month or different, different each month, but not too much. Over how long of a period did you So it was a year. It was a year. A year, yeah. Twelve months, we went. So the question was what the best part of this is. This is a question about the second film I think we saw in Park. Mm -hmm. which is partly black and white and partly color, and it has a 
at least one really incredible transition between one and the other. I'm, I'm wondering what the inspiration was to use two stocks in the first place. Was it just to create that transition or were there other considerations? Um, I mean, of, I, I often work with the black and white and color. I like it. I like the two different um, I mean, black and white is a little more abstract and not so much realistic, but um, yeah, I like the two. So, and I also like the combination. And um, uh, maybe, maybe the transition, the particular one, I don't remember. But it is not always very conscious uh, which, which materials. It, it's also sometimes the materials in the camera. You know, it's just I have the black and white three minutes, so I go with the black and white. But sometimes when I, when I, when I know maybe snow, for instance, or sledging, then I then I start a black and white uh, a film. But then if it's in, I film maybe something else also in black and white. So it's not completely. I'm not so strict. But um, uh, yeah, I think what was it? What one? No, I don't know which which transition. But there were several. I was also thinking. And, and the black and white here is really black and white because it is a silent film, so it allowed me to edit the black and white and color sections. Usually you have to decide, you have to print on color stock, you know? But here the, the, the contrast is, is more beautiful, of course, when you can keep the real black and white qualities. So anything about the Mencken and Tate or, or some questions about it or? Um, I do want to just mention with the yeah. uh, Murray Mencken's air dust for Camp Anger yeah. that the sound, um, the way this film is distributed by Filmmakers Co-op is that the sound is all set, separate. So it's we were projecting a silent 16 with... Um, ah, interesting. That's, that's how this... this I have seen copies of that film, of course, with a married soundtrack. Yeah. But this is how this particular print at uh, Filmmakers Co-op is cool. circulated. Cool. So cool. it's slightly performative. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> good to know. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. I think I think this oh. is good. I hope you'll join us on Sunday at 4 um, for a, yeah, another set of very beautiful films. And Uta, thank you so much yeah, for your work. Yeah, thank you, Susan. <laughs> thanks. Thanks. <laughs>